All right. Thank you all for having me here at Nerd Coachella. It's exciting. <laughs> there are a lot of you. Why are you all here? Um, OK, I think there is housekeeping we need to do first, but it is not actually on my screen. Because we are terrified of what you will say if we allow you to speak to me unmediated, we have a special way of asking questions. You go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and you put in the code hashtag SXSW. And then you can ask me a question, and I can choose whether or not to answer it. There's some kind of upvoting feature. It's going to be great. All right. So I promised to talk today about how to break industries. I am a journalist. Uh, as Todd mentioned, I am the editor at large at Vox.com. Before that, I was at the Washington Post. Before that, the American Prospect. I've been doing this since roughly 2003. And I just cover exclusively things being terrible. Like, that is my job. I cover why shit is fucked up and bullshit. <laughs> this, you might remember, it's not behind me, is it? It's over there. That, you might remember, is a sign from Occupy Wall Street. And it got famous because it expressed something at that moment that people felt, that there was some inchoate sense of deep wrongness. Not a thing wrong, everything wrong. There's another image that I've loved for years. Um, I'm a comic books fan. And uh, if you've not read the Matt Fraction uh, Hawkeye run, you should. But there's a bit in that where they're reading the paper. And if you zoom in, <laughs> that's what covering the news is like. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this feeling we have that everything is awful but nobody seems to do anything about it. It just keeps getting worse. And I want to talk about the way the news and us, the way we understand the news, the way we understand the world, are partially at fault. And in everything I say, I want you to know that this is coming for me in a time of unsettledness. This is coming at a time when I don't think by any means I have the answers. I don't think anybody else does, as far as I can tell. Or at least if they do, I don't think we know which people they are. And I think we need to question some things that are pretty fundamental in the industries we've come to take for granted, and even in the way that we approach and interact with the world. So the question of this talk, why is everything awful? Why does it all feel awful? The industries that I think are associated with the awfulness, anyway, the ones that I have been covering the most past 10 or 15 years, government, the US government, Wall Street, uh, they don't get as much attention now, but they made everything really bad. <laughs> the media, which I'm, of course, part of, and increasingly technology. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, I would not have put them on this list. Three years ago, four years ago, Tech was the one thing people liked, but it's not now. There is an easy explanation. It's the explanation that you get when you open most media. It's the explanation that fits most easily with the way we think. The world is full of jerks. Look around. Not necessarily around here. <laughs> you are attending my talk. You're wonderful. <laughs> you are good, upstanding, idealistic people. But out there, fucking jerks. <laughs> what if that explanation's wrong? What if it's not that every politician is a self-interested, craven toad, that the heads of tech companies are billionaires with no interest in human welfare, that people on Wall Street, well, that, that one's tougher for me, to be honest. <laughs> that the media is not just people trying to mislead you with fake news. One of the things here that's real deep is that human beings, we think in stories about other human beings. It's the way our minds work. And the media is composed of human beings telling stories about human beings to other human beings. That's the whole game. And so when we explain how things are working, we 
rest incredibly heavily on the decisions individual human agents are making. I cannot tell you how much of reporting, political reporting, financial reporting, media reporting, tech reporting, all of it, is about asking people, what were they thinking when they made that decision? Why did they make that decision? What happened in that meeting? And then everything is framed as contingent, as an outcome of, well, they heard this argument, and then that argument. This person left the room, and that person was at the table. Think about like everything you read. It's basically all like that. And we take it at face value, more or less, because it's the way we experience the world ourselves. It's the way we feel about ourselves. That is how we feel when we are making decisions. Like the questions that we asked in our own head were the actual questions we were answering. The question this raises is how human beings drink water. Um, the question this raises is how human beings make choices. Is the model that we rely on here a good model? Do we have this right when we report on these stories, when we write up these profiles, when we ask people to give us an account of their own reasoning? Are they reliable narrators? Are we reliable narrators about ourselves? You might wonder if I'm about to say yes and then just end the presentation, <laughs> but I'm not. The concept I want to talk about here is called motivated reasoning. This quote is from Yale law professor Dan Cahan, who does fantastic work looking at the way people make their decisions, the way people think through information. Um, and he says, he defines motivated reasoning as when a person is conforming their assessments of information to some interest or goal that is independent of accuracy. John Haidt, who's a New York University psychologist, uh, some of you may know. He's written a great book called The Righteous Mind. He's got a very, very, very good analogy for this. He calls it the rider and the elephant. Says that 90% like, of our brain is the elephant. It's just running around. And then there's this rider on top. That's our kind of higher cognition. That is the voice in our head. That is a part of our decision making we understand. And we think the rider is control. But he writes, the rider acts as a spokesman for the elephant, even though it doesn't necessarily know what the elephant is really thinking. The rider is skilled at fabricating post hoc explanations for whatever the elephant has just done, and it is good at finding reasons to justify whatever the elephant wants to do next. This is an account of how our minds work. And it is, I spent a lot of time going through the psychological literature. It is overwhelmingly proven at this point. It is replicated. You can see it in experiments that put you in an MRI machine, that just give you information. We can show it again and again. We've been looking at it since the 50s. It goes all the way back to David Hume, Hume who said, reason is a slave to the passions. We've known this forever. We've proven it over and over and over. But it is one of these pieces of information. It is one of these changes in how you see the world that once you make it, it sucks. It is a terrible thing to know about yourself, that most cognition is happening before you even had time to know it's happening, that a ton of what you are doing is rationalizing what you've already decided to do, that thinking feels like thinking, but is in fact rationalization. I could go through a bunch of studies here. It would be boring. I figured I'd just take the screenshot because I'm also lazy. Um, <laughs> This is how it works. We get information, and lightning fast, we assess it against our group memberships, our tribal memberships, our incentives. We make the decisions we need to make, and then we rationalize the decisions we need to rationalize. And this is key because we are good at it. We are good at it. And you know what's scary? Smarter people are better at it. So, there's a bunch of studies on this, and, and, and this I think is actually, it's worth dwelling, for, dwelling on it for a moment. The idealized concept of how to fix like everything is we're just gonna give people more information, give them better education, more civic education, 
more media literacy, whatever it might be. And that with all this knowledge, with all this intellectual power, they will get better at finding truth. In fact, in a lot of cases, particularly cases where something about us is being threatened, this is called identity protective cognition, a case where we have to make it, where if we make a decision, a particular kind of decision, it will threaten how the people we love feel about us, our ability to make a living, whatever it might be. Then the more information you have, the smarter you are, the better you are at pushing yourself where you need to go, all the way to deceiving yourself. There are fascinating studies by Larry Bartels and Chris Akins who show that if you know more about politics, if you are a higher information political junkie, you are more likely to believe untrue things that favor your side. And why is that? Why are people political junkies? Because they're heavily invested in one side or another. I mean, think about who knows a lot about sports. Uh, the answer, number one, is not me. I do not know anything about sports. I literally do not know what sports are currently in season. A couple of years ago, my wife decided, said that she wanted to go see a bunch of the DC sports teams. So we were going to go make a tour of sports ball in the DC area. And she brought a sign that said, uh, excellent sportsmanship. So like when somebody like shook the other person's hand after they made a basket, you could like be like, yay, excellent sportsmanship. You're not going to be surprised to learn that neither myself nor my wife, with that level of investment in local teams, do not know all that much about sports. <laughs> Cannot tell you that much about what's going on. The people who know a lot are the people who have invested, the people who have an allegiance. There's a book on sports rivalries called To Hate Like This Is To, Love for, is to Live Forever. First, it's a great book title. And if you write a book, you should have a title like that. But We invest in things. We get a lot of information because we care. And when we care, that quantum of caring, that is the channel through which our reasoning runs. And then because we're smart, because our brains are tremendous reasoning machines, because we are really good at assembling information in a complex world into the arrangement it needs to be, we figure out the argument. And it's usually a good argument that gets us where we need to go. So if you take this model of human reasoning, then what you're saying is that in order to understand the way we make decisions, you can't just be looking at people. You need to be looking at the incentives shaping the people. You need to look at the systems people are part of. What is the larger structure in which they're making their decisions? Because the larger structure, it may not decide everything, but it is going to decide a lot of where they ultimately come down. What is happening around them, whether or not they know it, whether or not we know it, whether or not I know it, what is happening around us is driving the answers we come to. It is driving which information we think is credible, which arguments we find persuasive, which authorities we trust. And all that comes together, and it gets us where we need to go, even if it felt the whole time like we were just searching for the truth. Like, we're just trying to make the best call. Let's talk about Congress. I used to have a, um, I should have put this slide in here, because uh, everybody likes it. Michael Bennett, who's a senator from Colorado, one of um, the, sometimes you see people enter Congress, and they're good, decent people, and you just watch them become increasingly horrified about what's happening around them that they thought they would go and become a member of Congress or the US Senate and be like, great. And then they get there, and they're just appalled. <laughs> um, and he's one of them. He's gone in, and he was not a politician before he got appointed to the US Senate. And he went in, and he just has this constant like, wait, are you guys seeing this too? Like, always. Um, it's a very, it's charming. But it's also, you listen to him, and it's depressing. But he used to, he put up on the floor of Congress this chart showing congressional approval compared to other things. And it's lower than banks during the financial crisis, lower than airlines, lower than Paris Hilton, 
lower than communism, lower than um, the US becoming, I'm sorry, lower than Richard Nixon during Watergate. Like Congress is unpopular. People do not like it. And the reason people don't like it is it, not, it doesn't do anything. I mean, it just screwed up the tax system. But aside from screwing up the tax system, it gets very little done. It constantly feels gridlocked. People are always arguing with each other. And we hate it. We look at it and we hate it. It doesn't seem like this is how a system should work. Every, everyone seems to be more intent on fighting than to the public than to get things done. But what is the incentive of Congress? Like, what have we actually set up there? If you really stop and think about how Congress works, it's total lunacy. I have covered more legislative debates than I can count. And every one of them begins the same way. Every one of them, I go to some think tank event where experts on the left and experts on the right are talking about the issue. And they always can come up with ways that they both think it would be better. Healthcare, taxes, whatever it might be, there is not an issue I have seen where experts cannot come together or members of Congress just talking things out and say, you know what, yeah, that would be better. We would both like that better. And then every one of those issues, with very few exceptions, by the end, is a bitter, vicious party line war. Why? Because policy is positive sum. You can change policy to make multiple players better off simultaneously. Politics is zero sum. Only one party can win an election. And it is worse than that. The way you win an election, if you're in the majority, is you get things done. The way you win an election, if you're in the minority, is people think the majority is not getting things done. How often would you cooperate with the people you work with if you cooperating with them meant you might get fired? That is literally how it works. Like the boss comes to you and says, Mike over there, in order to get this project done, needs your help. But if you help him, Mike's going to get a promotion, and I'm going to cut your pay in half. <laughs> How hard do you work to help Mike? So obviously, what people do in that situation, and I spend a lot of time talking to members of Congress, is not say, well, here's the thing. I'm cynical. And I'd prefer the country is poorly governed than I'm out of power for even another day. So I'm going to try to destroy them. I'm not saying people never say this. Sometimes Mitch McConnell says this aloud, which is unusual. <laughs> but they usually don't say it aloud. That's usually not what they do. What they do is over time, they come to explain to themselves that everything the other side wants is bad. For me, the canonical example of this is the individual mandate in healthcare. It is a there was a day in 2010 when every Republican in the Senate voted for a constitutional amend, uh, a, a resolution saying that the Senate believed the individual mandate was unconstitutional. And at that moment, 10 of them were still co-sponsors on a bill with an individual mandate in it. It was their idea. But I talked to a lot of them. They didn't feel that what they had done was cynical. They were not insincere. People do not like feeling insincere. They just changed their mind to everything the other side wants is bad. And by the way, Democrats do it too. Um, Democrats do it too. You can see it in the way drone strikes were dealt with in the Bush years versus the Obama years. Motivated reasoning is powerful. It's not the only thing that happens, but it's powerful. This is a quote I love. This is Representative Pete Sessions. He ran the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. So he ran the Republican effort to take back the House in 2010. He was successful. Then they had a retreat for all their members. Now they had taken back the House. They were going to be in the majority. And he said in a presentation, he said, what is the purpose of the majority? The purpose of the majority is to govern. And then he said, what is the purpose of the minority? The purpose of the minority is to become the majority. When that is your incentive in a system where nothing gets done if there is not cooperation, what do you think happens? Let's talk about Wall Street. The problem, irresponsible trading that underprices long-term risk and crashes the global economy and miserating tens of millions of people. <laughs> it's bad. What is the incentive on Wall Street? 
It's to make a lot of money now. It's to do it quickly. And so what is the rationalization even when things seem kind of crazy? It's that if everyone else is making money off of this thing, we better be too. It's not to say there aren't traders, because there are, who follow heterodox strategies. But by nature, it's not going to be most of them. And there's an old line that the market can be irrational longer than you can be solvent. If they're making big returns over there and you're not, you're screwed. Um, the quote here that I always love, well, I don't know about love, but Citigroup CEO Chuck Prince in July of 2007, so just like right before everything went to hell, wrote, said, when the music stops in terms of liquidity, things are going to be complicated. But as long as the music is playing, you got to get up and dance. And we're still dancing. Anyway, we bailed out Citigroup a couple months later. But that's an incentives problem. Look, I've talked to a lot of these folks. They're not bad people. They didn't want to crash the economy. Um, but they're in an industry where what it is demanding of them, you get what you get. The media. This one hurts, because I am guilty of anything I've talked about here. But what do we have? Why are people pissed off? Um, clickbait is one. You hear that a lot. Polarization, I think, is a big one. Just the feeling of cocooning, reactiveness, and speed over depth. I think speed over depth is behind a lot more of this than people realize. What's our incentives, um, particularly digitally? The digital incentives are very different than the old incentives. It's traffic. It's engagement. It's shares. I mean, sometimes it's SEO. I mean, there are other things happening, too. There are subscriptions. I don't want to. Nothing is any one thing. But our incentives are get people to look. Our incentives are to be first. Our incentives are to be the one who are rising faster than the others on CrowdTangle. And so you get into a rationalization structure where covering what shares becomes covering what, ma what matters. Where the intensity the audience feels towards something becomes a measure of its importance. And look, a lot of us, Vox included, we work hard to cover things and make things interesting that are maybe not in the news. But all of us, we are very pushed towards the new and towards, conf and towards conflict and towards the thing everybody is yelling about right now rather than sometimes the things that are deeper and more important and slower and harder. And so you get a lot of cranked up headlines. You get a lot of going faster than we actually have understanding for. I feel it all the time at Vox. We want to explain the news. You know what? Sometimes it's hard to find it, figure out what the hell is going on. Sometimes the news doesn't have good answers behind it. Sometimes something is broken and everybody wants to know what's going on, but you don't quite know yourself yet. And there's always this question, do we wait? How much information do we gather? Can we put up something smaller as we wait to do the bigger thing? What are the right balances to strike? And I can tell you that as you see everybody else go up with stories, it feels really bad to not be up with yours yet. And so you tell yourself, well, I got to be there for the audience. And maybe you go a little faster than you should. I certainly have. It's very hard to resist that. And it isn't because you're saying to yourself, this isn't ready. It's because you're saying to yourself, well, we need to be there too. It's what the audience and needs of us. It's what we've promised them. It's hard to slow down when everybody's going fast, but if everybody's going fast and everybody just goes faster, it's tough. Tech. And I, I, I say social media here because I don't like that we use the word technology to refer just to, to Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever. Um, energy is technology. It doesn't have issues around engagement specifically. <laughs> But in the conversation we are having over tech, and a lot of you are taking pictures of this slide. It's, it's not even a good slide. I, I'm not even good at it. I just realized today that you could click a thing in Google Drive, uh, and it would change all of your slides to white text on black. I was so excited. <laughs> this looks so much more professional than it did when I just hadn't clicked that. And it was just um, white background. I can't tell. I mean, I understand now why you're taking pictures of this. It's very, 
It's very nice. <laughs> Social media, the, what are people upset about? We're addicted. It feels bad. Negative emotions dominate. There was just a study that came out yesterday that on Twitter, fake news spread six times faster than real news. That sucks. We're upset about bot armies. We're upset about the fact that it makes us hate our families because we know what they think about politics. It, it feels bad. And we're upset that it has all these things built into it that are meant to hijack our brains, right? That's what Tristan Harris is talking about, who I think is here this week, that it's built on the principles of slot machines, that it's got these infinite scrolls, that we always feel that there's something we're missing, and then it goes away. How hard would it be for Spotify to just leave your Discover up instead of making you find it by Monday or it disappears forever, right? That's not nice. They could just like push that down in the playlist and it could just say last week's Discover. But no, you either get there by Monday or you're screwed. What's the incentive? Engagement. It's a zero-sum war for your attention. Uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, he said his main competitor is sleep. And I'm like, he's winning. <laughs> when people, I mean, and what's the rationalization? Because you hear it. When people use something more, it's because they want it more. When the algorithm changes so we come back more, that means we like it more. I often think when I hear this stuff, what if you just apply this analysis to heroin? Like the analysis how, of how we do a lot of consumer technology and a lot of attention questions, it also like, makes sense for addictive drugs. But we understand there that it's bad. Um, but here, we don't quite have the same view. And I'm not comparing it to hair. I mean, literally, I did. But <laughs> I don't think it is as bad. Just to be clear, my position is that opioids are worse than social media, um, although better for pain management. And there's a lot of rationalization about what the behaviors they can elicit mean. And it's very smart people. It's very good people. It's people who care about making the world a better place. But the system they're in, what they need for their stock price to go up, for to seem like growth is still happening so the best engineers come work for them, they can begin to rationalize shrinking. They can't see the lines go way down. Mark Zuckerberg um, and Jack Dorsey, actually, to be fair, both of them have begun talking a little bit more about this. And Zuckerberg said, I see this much more as a response to a threat, but said, you know, he wants to move towards time well spent, meaningful engagement. They made a change. Um, it led to people spending a minute less on Facebook on average a day, which meant 50 million hours less on Facebook a year. They can't cut that by half. Who is it? <laughs> um, they can't cut that by half. That doesn't work. All right. Here, like cards on the table. What's cool about being a journalist, you don't need to have any answers for anything. <laughs> um, I am not here to give you this terrible last chapter where it's like, having described the problem with human life as large scale systems that are resistant to change, here is how, no, I don't have the answer. What I have hopefully is a framework. What I have hopefully is a way of looking at the problems we have in the world that makes a little bit more sense, that is a little bit better, that allows smarter people than me to begin coming up with answers. What I have, hopefully, is the question, which is, we are not facing a question solely of, or even mainly of, in most cases, who is running the system. We are more often facing questions of what is the system that is running the people? What is the system running us? What is the system running the people who are putatively in charge of it? What are the rules of the game that are making otherwise decent, smart people act the way they act? And when you see solutions, and when you see reporting that is all about individuals, that just swap that person out with that one, be skeptical. The problems we have are systemic. And they are, very, they are not going to be solved if we can't actually see and then change the systems behind them. So with that said, I'd love to take your questions.
Oh, I can do that right here with this Slido. <laughs> I'm going to go with the third one first. I'm getting depressed. Do you have any hope for the future? <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> um, so here's the thing that's weird. Everything is terrible, and then also it isn't. Everything is terrible, and also it is maybe going on a five-year lag, right? Globally better than it's ever been. We face really hard problems, but it is a kind of arrogance to believe they are uniquely hard. Now, there are some problems we face that I think are reasonably civilizational in scale. So I kind of want to put climate change over here. But the rest of it, I was at a, um, I gave a speech the other day that ultimately the question asked at the speech was, what is the future of political parties? But in the initial version that they wanted us to do, it was, has politics ever been this bad? And I joked that I was just going to say the Civil War and leave. Because <laughs> yes, it's all been worse. I'm reading, a, a, I've been reading a lot of books about how democracy is screwed right now. Uh, and they're good. I recommend them political tribes and how democracies die and the people versus democracy. But they keep talking about how it's worse than ever. It's not. Even in this country, it's not worse than it was 50 years ago. This country disenfranchised massive portions of the electorate for basically its whole history. So do I have hope for the future? I do. I actually think in many ways our systems, though under a lot of stress now, are getting better. I think there are a lot of places where there are incentives to do better. I think that a lot of what I'm talking about, it doesn't overly distort, say, medical research. I think there are things happening that we should take enormous pride and, and interest in. I think driverless cars could be tremendous. That's a way that we might end, end basically, or radically cut traffic fatalities. So many fewer people die from cigarettes now than did before. Nobody died in a commercial plane accident last year, thanks apparently to Donald Trump, according to him. <laughs> he's sitting there with like the orange cones. Um, so yes, I have hope for the future, but these are hard problems to solve. I have hope for the future, but part of my hope for the future comes from not having an overly nostalgic view of the past. I don't have hope that the future is going to be in any near term just, or for a lot of people good. But I have hope that the future could be better. And that's a kind of hope. How do we save local investigative journalism when there is absolutely no reason for it to survive economically? Well, that is, <laughs> the, the back half of that question is rough. Um, This is a kind of statement that can get me in trouble. There are some things that are too important to just be left to the market. There are some things that are just too important to be left solely to the market. Now look, not all local journalism is endangered. Um, there are local papers doing well. Vox Media actually has a huge local component in Eater and Curbed and other things that we do. Um, there are interesting commercial enterprises happening at the local level. Um, SB Nation, uh, our sports site, has all these local brands. So I don't want to take away from that. But the point that local investigative journalism is expensive and time consuming and often has trouble making a return on, on that investment is true. We know there are things that we think of as public goods that the market will just not provide fully. And in those cases, we need to think about how philanthropy, and we need to think about how, in some cases, government can step in. Uh, in Europe, there are countries that do a lot more to subsidize the press. Um, we do a lot to subsidize different kinds of organizations in this country. Now, I'm not saying that I'm comfortable with all of them. But already you see some of it, right? Groups like ProPublica that are, that are um, nonprofits so that donations to them can be tax deductible. That's a way of helping, right? 
there are ways that you can subsidize things. Uh, their PBS is subsidized very famously. The way to not let local investigative journalism die is to value it, is to value it individually such that we pay for it, subscribe to your local newspaper, is to value it societally so that if that's not working, we think about how to pool around it. It would, we spend a lot more money on much dumber things in local investigative journalism. It would not be so crazy to think about how to create an independent board that could fund grants to local outlets. I mean, this stuff, it, it's not rocket science. It is about what we value as a country, what we value as a people. I think that sometimes we can get caught in a market inevitability discourse where it's like, well, it's not making much money, so I guess we can't have that anymore. Sometimes I imagine, given the set of ideological boundaries we have now, can you imagine if somebody proposed building libraries today? Do you ever just think about that? If somebody came up and said, I have an idea for a bill, we're going to make these buildings where you can get books for free no matter how much money you make. And we're going to put one in every city. There is a point in our country where we decided, you know what? That was worth it. It was worth it for people to be able to read. And not just that. We weren't just going to subsidize poor kids getting books, if them, and then put a work requirement on it for their parents. <laughs> we were just going to have libraries. I often get accused, probably fairly, of being a neoliberal. But I think that we have lost a language for talking about public goods. I think we have lost a language for thinking about things that are important but may not be that commercially viable. And I think we need to get it back. A lot of these problems are not hard. They're just about what we choose to value. And it's not as if the question of how to move money around or how to disperse money is some technical thing we cannot solve. I'll go for, <laughs> I like this anonymous one. Um, what problems are you trying to solve at Vox? What besides news keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Melissa Bell, my co-founder and publisher, is somewhere in the audience getting very nervous. Um, it's also her birthday. Happy birthday, Melissa. Hey. I'm going to answer this question because I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, I know in a specific way what problems are we trying to solve. We are trying to make better products all the time. We are trying to do a better job explaining the news all the time. We just launched a new daily news explainer podcast, Today Explained. Um, if you have not signed up for it, it's totally amazing. Whoever cheered is great, and it wins best audience member. <laughs> in a day-to-day -day way, we're trying to do a better and better job delivering on the thing that we are trying to deliver on, which is to make the news comprehensible, to explain the context you need to understand the thing that just happened. But I recognize that this is a bigger question than that, and I want to answer it in a bigger way. I feel really unsettled about the media right now. I feel unsettled about my own role in it. I feel unsettled about it as a whole. I think that there's been a lot of talk about Trump delegitimizing the media. And I don't think that's the right way to think about it. For all the talk of fake news, people are subscribing more, they're clicking more. The media, the media is healthy. In some ways, it's nationally, specifically, has not been healthier. But what Donald Trump is trying to do is make the media into the opposition party. And I worry that he is succeeding and that there are days when we are helping him succeed. I think a lot about his fake news awards from a month ago or whatever it was. And like a lot of things Trump does, it had this quality of being simultaneously ridiculous and chilling. I mean, the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, keeps tweeting about how he's going to run a fake news awards. Then he puts it up and puts up the wrong link. And then it, like the whole thing was a, like a fiasco. But, you know, us, we in the media, spent that day tweeting these jokes about how, oh no, I left my tux at the dry cleaners, and it's an honor just to be nominated for the fake news awards. And, and we seemed, in that moment, 
through our exhaustion and our frustration, and in some cases our anger and our mockery, more like the thing he says that we are. Trump has a quality of making things more like himself. The way he divides people, the way he rolls grenades into cultural cleavages, the, what he calls forth in us, he works, I think, he works to call forth our most bitter tribalized identities. And he's a president, he sets the agenda, he's able to do it. I worry about in a much more competitive media landscape, in a much more digital media landscape, how we don't, in, a, in an increasingly polarized country where our, our party identities and our ideological identities and our gender and racial and geographical and cultural identities and all these ide religious are stacking more and more. Where you can tell me a couple things about you and I will know with increasing certainty who you vote for in a way that didn't used to be true. I worry about how that interacts with all those things I was talking about, that tribal cognition. I worry about how to express doubt. This is something I'm struggling with. I told you I feel unsettled. A lot of the forms in which we write and think in the media, they don't really allow for the expression of doubt. They come from this place of authority, the way we write. And it often, I go back and I read it, and it reads a whole lot more authoritative than I feel. I don't know how to express a doubt right now. Um, I worry about a lot, uh, to be honest. These are things that at Vox we are trying to figure out how to be on the right side of. These are trends that at times have moved faster than we have, and we're trying to think about how we need to change in response. These are, and these are things that are kind of beyond just the question, which is a hard question itself of how to keep up with the news, of how to figure out what's happening with the steel tariffs, of how to report on an administration that often itself cannot internally give you a coherent account of what it's doing. I think this is a tough time. I don't think it's just a time of business model flux. A couple of years ago, that's what it felt like. But our political system, our country, feels like it's in a place of change. And I think navigating that as opposed to being overwhelmed by it is hard. And I think it will require change from us at Vox and from everybody. And so we're thinking a lot about that and what that means from us in the coming year and the coming years. So there are two hypocrisy questions here. So I'll try to, I'll just, they're kind of the same, but I'll answer the one from, I just want you guys to know, one is asked by let's get real and the other is asked by isn't it ironic, don't you think? <laughs> Isn't it ironic, don't you think, asks, how do we hold politicians more accountable to the painfully obvious hypocrisy they spew repeatedly, like we hate deficits until tax breaks mean larger deficits? I don't know um, what accountable means in this context. Something I'm thinking a lot about is the degree to which we thought that um, there were kind of external mechanisms by which if politicians got held accountable for being hypocrites or whatever, they would have to stop. But I think something we've really seen in the past couple of years, particularly as the media splinters, is that you don't. A lot of what we were relying on for politicians' accountability was a sense of shame. There were still, you know, if you're in a safe seat and all you need to do is win your primary, what do you care if the media says you're a hypocrite? Well, you care because it hurts when people call you names. We're all people. We're all just like a scared kindergartner inside, where a lot of us are. But Trump, as a kind of apex of this, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you think he's a liar. He doesn't care if you think he's stupid, or mean, or cruel, or a bully. The way he acts, the reason other people don't act like that in some cases, is that they don't want people to see them that way. But what if you don't care? It turns out you have a lot more freedom than we thought. So I mean, we can try. We can write about how you're a hypocrite. But the people who read that are the ones who already think you're a hypocrite. There was a study about fake news and about fact checking. And it found in this massive data set that they could not find one example 
They could find that the fake news was well read and the fact checks were well read, but they did not find a single example of a person who had read a piece of fake news reading a fact check on that news. So it's hard. I don't have an answer on that. Voters, you need to hold people accountable. But voters themselves, what looks like hypocrisy to one person is not hypocrisy to another. We all are good at coming up with rationalizations and then believing them. This, to me, is a genius of Kellyanne Conway's alternative facts. If you go back and listen to how she said that and then what she said about it after, her genius is realizing that when you're on cable news, you don't need to be right. It's not actually a scored debate. What you need is to have something you're saying. You need to make mouth noises. Because the people who want to agree with you, they're not checking. You just need to have said some stuff. Sometimes I see, sometimes I'll follow these links on YouTube to so and so debunk such and such. And I'll follow the link and I'll watch it. And there's just like, there's no debunking in there. They're just saying they don't like the thing. But everybody's like, yeah, me neither. It's debunked. Um, Working in media, I agree we have a big problem chasing quantitative goals such as clicks. How do we change this? What's your take on a better news for the masses? I'd say a couple things here. One, I want to be careful, and this is where my own rationalizations may come into play, that we don't underrate trying to find an audience. Because I think a real problem with previous generations in media is that we didn't chase clicks. We decided that we were going to do some news for the rubes and then some news for the people who were like the news junkies. But if the hard stuff just never attracted an audience, that was fine. It was the vegetables. It was over there. That we did it is kind of like you should do it, but it didn't have to be good. So I never want to take the responsibility off of us for making important things interesting. I never want to take the responsibility off of us for making it so people need to, I never want it to not be our problem to meet the audience halfway. That's what we think. If you want to ask what we think about a Vox every day, it is that. How do we build the bridge? If you've decided you want to learn about something, but you don't know anything about it, how do we make sure you can really learn about it? How do we make sure that we've given you something where you actually get a good, serious, sophisticated tour through that issue without any knowledge asked for in the first place? But chasing clicks can go way beyond that, right? And it has. It does every day, including for us. So one thing is to diversify business models. One thing is to diversify business models. Very few of the big publishers, including Vox Media, just rely on a pure scale play. Um, we need, if we're on advertising models, we need really good brands to want to be near our content. Um, we want people to come to conferences. We have other things we're doing. Vox is making a Netflix show, um, Vox.com. Uh, you know, we have people subscribing to our podcast. So we need partners to want to work to, with us. We need you all to want to subscribe. So you can't take it all the way, right? You can't just go pure scale. But I don't know. I, am, I will definitely say personally, and this is not a statement on behalf of Vox, I've been thinking a lot about whether there are parts of subscription revenues that are healthier, whether or not the move away from that is actually good for the media. Um, certainly the way the Times and New Yorker recently, uh, and somewhat the Post and the Atlantic and the Trump era have been able to monetize subscriptions, I think has been pretty uh, encouraging. And I think that there are some parts of subscriptions that are, in some ways, a healthier incentive set, or at least a good incentive set to have alongside other things. Again, that's not a statement of anything we are doing. It's just a statement of something I am thinking about. I think that we need to care more about loyalty than clicks. And I think the media is actually undergoing that change. We've been thinking about that a lot at Vox for you know, a while now. Um, but with what Facebook is doing, with what the different platforms are doing, I think everybody understands that just betting on whoever's giving you the most clicks right now for reasons that you don't control is not a safe way to build your organization. Um, I think the kind of Facebook reckoning the media is going through is probably ultimately a healthy thing. I think a lot of people got way too attached to Facebook. Um, I think that long term, there's always a business model in creating content people love. The question is, how do you know you're doing it, and how do you not mistake traffic for that? 
And so I think part of it is also being able to have that eye on your audience and whether or not you're actually building something that if it went away, they would miss, as opposed to something that they just keep clicking on because they see things that grab their eye in Facebook. And so part of it is also just a cultural change. Remember, for a long time, we had a different business model, but we also had to figure out how to get people to read us, and we did. Um, I see a lot of very positive signs in media. I see positive things in how some of the new platforms are creating their incentives. Podcasting, I think, is a really, really, really encouraging space. I think what that's asking of people with that kind of subscription, that kind of needing people to want you affirmatively, I think that's been really good for us. So I think there's a lot of good things going on. Um, but I also think this is hard. I think we do need audience. I know we need audience. And so a lot of it has to be us checking ourselves. I know that's not a satisfying answer, but a lot of times hard questions don't have easy answers. Has reporting become more fun with Donald Trump? No. That's it. That's, you can go back to the questions. <laughs> I, I don't think, there are reporters who like chaos, for sure. I am not one of them. This is not to take anything away from them. It's just, if you can watch what's going on and it looks fun, the stakes are too high. It's just, You're not supposed to roll the dice like this with nuclear weapons. You're just not. I talk to a lot of people in the White House. And the thing that is true in this White House that has never been true in another White House I've covered or any politician's office I've covered, Republican or Democrat, is that the people in it will not defend it. The most searing, terrifying, comments about the president come from the people who work for him. Every reporter knows it. The scariest things you hear come from the people in meetings with him. I'm not saying nobody who works for him sees good in the man. Some of them do. I'm not saying, I, I don't want to take it too far, but when you hear about how he runs a meeting or what he knows and doesn't know, or what he can absorb and can't absorb, or how he gets his information, or what will win him somebody's trust, or what will win his trust in somebody, it's scary. I hope that it's all going to be fine. So far, we've not gone to war. So far, you know, there have been real disasters like Puerto Rico, but the world has not ended. But this is a lot of risk. And it's not a game. And if people die, they don't get brought back. And every day that the decisions that are being made are being made with this little thought and this little care, it just scares me. I find, I honestly, I find it really hard. I find it really psychologically hard to live, to, to live in this news cycle or to work in this news cycle. I find that to really look at it, to constantly see it, in its truth, is just really scary. But then if you stop, then you've stopped seeing it. And it's just a psychologically, I, I don't find it to be a pleasant place to be. Why is the dysfunction you describe in Congress any different from the past? Was it better in the past? If yes, why? If not, do you know a better system? It was better in the past. But that doesn't mean the country was better. This is an important piece. We talk a lot about polarization. And in our system, polarization ends up meaning a lot of things. We mostly just mean it to mean bad, bitter, angry. That's not what it means. Polarization is a measure of how parties are sorted. They're a measure of whether all the Republicans agree with the Republicans and all the Democrats agree with the Democrats. For a long time in American life, an unusual thing about American politics compared to other countries was our parties were not polarized. Our parties just weren't polarized. The 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the low ebb of polarization in American life. Our parties weren't polarized. There were liberal Republicans. There were conservative Democrats. There were cross-party coalitions. The Civil Rights Bill was a bipartisan bill. Medicare was a bipartisan bill. Why was that? Because we were an incredibly racist country. I'm not kidding. The South was democratic, and it was very ideologically conservative but it was democratic. Why was it democratic? 
because Republicans had invaded the South and because the Democratic Party in the South, whatever else it was, was a party that had the power and was committed to upholding the South's racial hierarchy. This is not, by the way, my weird theory. This is the standard political science explanation for polarization. In measures of polarization, usually you measure it on one dimension. For that period, you need a second dimension of race in order to be able to make sense of any of the numbers. But if you take race out, then everything looks normal. We passed a civil rights bill. The Democratic Party did that, um, primarily. And then things began to shift. Race stopped sorting the coalitions in the way it had. Liberal Republicans became Democrats. Conservative Southerners became Republicans. The parties became liberal and conservative. Republican means conservative. Democratic means liberal. If you look at measures of voting, for the 20th century, you almost always had Democrats more conservative than Republicans, or Republicans more conservative than Democrats. Strom Thurmond, when he was a Democrat, was the second most conservative member of the Senate. Congress needs compromise to work. That is how we've built it. What's unusual about the American system is how many veto points it has. Without polarized parties, it can get that compromise. That's how the founders built it. They hated parties. They didn't expect us to have parties. They wanted to create political parties, so it's their fault, but they did not build a system robust to parties. For a long time, the parties were not that polarized, although obviously we had periods like a civil war when they were much more polarized than now. But what we think of, the sort of American golden age, a 20th century, race had made our politics unusual. But it didn't mean the country was better. And by the way, it didn't mean our politics were less bitter overall. Political leaders were being assassinated. You had riots in the streets. Students were killed at Kent State. It was not a quiet time. But Congress worked better. In many ways, our divisions are much less deep right now. We're not arguing about the Vietnam draft, about segregation. Things have improved in that way. But our politics are more polarized and bitter. And one thing that always scares me I imagine sometimes what it would have been like to have these politics in that era. What would have happened in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s if we had this politics, these polarized parties? Would we have survived that period of fracture? I hope so, but I don't know. All right, we have a few minutes left, so here is the final question. So if it is about the system, not the people, then Trump is not the problem, but a symptom. That means getting rid of him is not enough. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. No, getting rid of Donald Trump is not enough. Getting rid of Donald Trump would solve the problem of Donald Trump being president. <laughs> right? If he loses the next election, he presumably will not be president anymore. I'd like to hope. But no, that will not be enough. Trump did not get elected in a vacuum. Why? I'll leave you all with this thought. We spend a lot of time, even still, Relitigating and thinking through the 2016 election. And when we do it, we almost always ask the easy question. Why did Hillary Clinton not get 80,000 more votes in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan? Was it Comey's letter? Was it Russian bots? Was it the debates? What was it? Was it that she didn't visit Wisconsin? Was it that her Michigan strategy sucked? What was it? That's a wrong question. That's the easy question. When you're talking about 80,000 votes with 150 million-ish or 160 million-ish, whatever it is, people voting, I mean, that's like a flap of a butterfly's wings. Everything made the difference. Everything you can come up with made the difference. 80,000 votes is nothing. Why was Donald Trump at 44%? How did he? get to a place where the whole election, he was basically normal. How did he get 90% of Republicans, about the same number Mitt Romney got? Why was the election so normal? He was such an unusual candidate. Heterodox, not supported by the official Republican Party during the primaries. Why then did he consolidate? Why, if you look at the results and you don't know who they're of, if you didn't know what country we lived in, I just gave you the polls. Would you look at that in 2012 and say, yeah, that makes sense. That seems like nothing really changed. 
It's because what's going on in our politics is a lot deeper. And it's deeper in a way that is creating a kind of stable chaos. It's because polarization is so deep that even if your party nominates someone you hate, you would still never vote for the other party. It's because we are a country that is undergoing extremely rapid and consequential demographic change, and that is destabilizing. In 2013, for the first time, a majority of infants in America were non-white. By 2045, according to projections, will be a majority minority country. In the past 40 years, we've gone from 4% foreign born to 17% foreign born. The people who feel America is changing, it is changing. And change is really hard on societies. Donald Trump is a symptom of that change. He is the kind of thing that happens amidst change like that. If he didn't happen, other things would and other things will. So yeah, here as elsewhere, I'm not saying people don't matter at all. Obviously, it would matter to not have Donald Trump as president. But Donald Trump is a product of his system. We are products of that system. Who runs, who wins in the future are products of the system. And no, getting rid of Trump is not enough. If you think something's wrong with politics, I just went, um, I'll leave you with this thought, I just went to a college the other day to give a talk, and I'd been there five years before, in 2013. And I realized that in 2013, the topic they had brought me to talk about was, what's the matter with American democracy? So that was before Trump. That was the kind of thing people wanted to talk about in 2013. So yeah, this is bigger. And so we need to see it as bigger. And on that note of pessimism, <laughs> thank you, nerds, for all coming out. <laughs>